Good afternoon. It feels like afternoon because it's very bright here, even though it's like 6 p.m. It's winter back home, so at this point, it's probably sunset. Um, is there any chance we could just get the slides for now? Um, sorry, this talk is a bit, you know, difficult. Let's see if we can just get the slides on for now. I'm sure the technical team will help me. In the meantime, um, I should probably start by introducing myself. My name is Ntlantla Lakinkosi. Um, well done, uh, Teja, for pronouncing my names. That was incredible. And I wear a lot of hats. But the main hat that has brought me here today is the fact that I am a software engineer. I'm from the beautiful city of Johannesburg in South Africa. Woo! And in South Africa, I work for an organization or company called BBD. The full name is Baron Budge and Dominic. We sound like a law firm, but it's a 38-year-old 38 38 bespoke software firm from South Africa. We build all sorts of software for banks and the likes. My job is slightly different from everyone else at BBD. I work in a team called ATC. We are responsible for the company's research and development functions, DevRel functions, um, but I think, well, specialized consulting. The most fulfilling part of our job is that we're also responsible for providing training to BBD's 1,000 odd employees across the world. And we also are responsible for finding new talent across the country. So, because I love JavaScript so much, I'm also the co-organizer of a monthly meetup called Josie JS. If you ever find yourself in South Africa, hit us up and give us a cool talk. And to try and expand access to JavaScript and this incredible tool that we love, We've also started something called Soeto.js to take JavaScript into the townships of South Africa as a start. The most important thing for you to know, however, is that my Twitter handle is at nlucky underscore Nkosi. Please feel free to tweet me and let me know what you think of this talk. So this talk is going to be slightly different from the rest of the talks that you will have heard today. I mean, we started off by talking about a proposal for typed JavaScript. How incredible is that? And we had some really, really informative talks. This is not one of them. <laughs> In this talk, I'm mostly going to be telling you about myself, a lot of the bad decisions that I've made, and a series of unfortunate events that have led to this moment right here. <laughs> I'll start off with a story. Like most good stories, it started off with me on my way home from a work function after a couple of beers. I accidentally ended up on a very cheap online shopping website called Wish. And <laughs> from the laughter, I'm guessing most of you know the site. And I seem to have bought a drone. So South Africa is very far from everything else. This drone took about four months to arrive. And when it arrived, I was like, who bought me a drone? I mean, <laughs> this is such a nice gift. I had no idea what was going on until I checked my order history. I was like, oh, I guess I bought myself a drone. The drone was called the SG900S. Really, really cool drone. It's got a couple of features. We'll get back to the drone in a second. I'm going to tell you a bit more about myself. A couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with something called narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder that's characterized by excessive sleepiness, excessive sudden sleepiness. Uh, which means that I could fall asleep right now. Don't worry, it won't happen. I am on medication. And also has a few scary things like sleep paralysis and all sorts of these things. Easily treatable, so it's not really a big problem. Around the same time, I was also diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You know it's a mouthful, right? That's why we just say ADHD. And what this combination means is that in a sitting like this one, where you have to sit down and listen to someone talk, or in a lecture hall, I'm usually in one of two states. A, I'm either trying to stay up and I'm struggling because, wow, it's a lot of information to take in, or B, the speaker will say something that grabs my attention and now I can't remember anything else that they said because my mind just drifted away. I'm sure there are quite a few people here that can resonate with that. And so when I attended a talk by a colleague of mine, Gergana Young, she put up the slide on her talk where she said, I flew my drone with Node.js. She had gotten a drone for her birthday. And she says, I crashed my drone with Node.js. <laughs> now, 
Jerry said a lot of very informative things during that talk, which I cannot recall at all. <laughs> that is because at that point, I thought, whoa, Jerry crashed the drone by flying it with Node. Then I thought, hold on, if Jerry could crash it by flying her drone with Node, I wonder how else I could crash a perfectly good drone. And so today I bring you five ways to kill a perfectly good drone. Cool. Let's get back to the drone. This drone, I got it and I had absolutely no use for it. I live in the city and it's illegal to fly a drone within I think 50 kilometers of a police station, a national key point, a school, which means that I can't fly the drone. So I decided I'm going to hack it and fly it with JavaScript. Now, as any expert hacker will tell you, and I'm not one of them, the first step to hacking is observation. You need to be able to see how this tool is working. Observe it, and only after that can you try to actually do your hacking. Now, I noticed that this drone was being controlled either by an RC controller or by an Android app. So I figured, I'm a software developer, an app is just code. If I can see what this app is doing, I can probably be able to mimic it and try and write something that'll do the exact same thing. So I walked around the office and I said, I'd like to see what this app is sending to the drone. People thought I had far too much time. Instead of being billable, I'm busy asking these dumb questions. And then someone in IT um, indulged me. They pointed me to this thing called Wireshark. Apparently with Wireshark, I can sort of like log all of the network activity at a port that I pointed to, and I was able to do that. Although, what happened is with the app, as soon as I started, uh, or rather, Wireshark was pointed at the drone, and I wasn't really able to see what the app was sending, rather I was seeing what the drone was receiving. And there seemed to be some sort of break there that I didn't really understand. Someone else recommended that I use Apple devices because they're apparently so closely synced and linked to each other that it would be easy to log the stuff. At the time, I didn't even use an iPhone, and so I convinced a friend of mine, his name is Matthew, to let me log all of his uh, network traffic on <laughs> for a day. Needless to say, I saw some interesting things on my friend's phone. But at this point, I realized that I've gone down this very deep rabbit hole, and I wasn't seeing an end to it. So I decided um, I should probably do something slightly smarter. And of course, at this point, I knew that I would want to show this to people. And because I care about your safety, right, especially the people sitting on beanbags, I decided to do something just slightly smarter and simply purchase a better drone, an easier drone to work with. The drone I bought is called the Parrot Mambo Mini. Apparently, they've discontinued this. I found this out at 2 a.m. this morning after crashing my drone in my hotel room. But this drone <laughs> is called the Parrot Mambo Mini. It's a really super cool drone, quite small, fits in the palm of my hand. I think I've got it over here. And it comes with some interesting accessories like a, a pellet shooter <laughs> to, I don't know, shoot at my audience. It's got claws, which means that I can send my drone to go and get me beer. That's the next talk that I'll probably work on. This drone has two ways of communicating. You can either use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Now, because I'd spent so much time learning about Wi-Fi, I decided let's focus on Bluetooth a bit for this one. And so <laughs> everything that you're seeing here will be Bluetooth-based. Now, Bluetooth or Bluetooth Low Energy is slightly different from traditional Bluetooth. Now, back in Africa, when Bluetooth came out, everyone had these things attached to their faces. <laughs> pretending to be in super serious meetings all the time. For people around my age, we didn't care about piracy laws. We were sending each other songs from Beyonce and the likes between each other's phones. Bluetooth Low Energy is slightly different from your traditional Bluetooth. And its differences can be characterized into three main things. The first is power consumption. BLE, can, BLE devices rather can work for years on end without the need of um, the batteries or the power supply being changed. This starts influencing the applications of Bluetooth Low Energy devices. These are ideal for applications where you want to send short messages over short amounts of time, as opposed to streaming like an HD video or sending a song and images across different devices. 
Another really interesting thing is that with BLE devices, you can connect up to, I think, 20 devices, as opposed to the hard limit of seven with traditional Bluetooth. Now, these numbers are impacted by the manufacturers, by the hardware, and of course, the software that we actually go and write. I promise to tell you about myself. So I come from a game development background. I studied game design. And in game design, we have two tools of choice, something called Unity 3D and the Unreal Engine. I was traumatized by C++, so <laughs> Unity is what I use. It's my go-to tool. I hit everything with it. The first app I've ever built, I built with Unity. Um, the first website I built <laughs> was with Unity and exported to web. It's incredible, right? And then I joined this team called ATC, and it just feels like I've gone through some sort of transformation, right? And it feels as though I've developed this new weapon, an axe, if you will, and it's called JavaScript. This is my new weapon, and I hit absolutely everything with it. <laughs> Ask me to build anything. Thank you. And JavaScript will be my tool of choice. That's not a very popular statement at work. Um, when I say that, most of the senior engineers just look at me and judge me. Um, but the person who actually helped me develop this new skill, his name is Mike Heiser, incredible, incredible web developer. He's a GDE as well. He gave a talk where he asked this very incredible question. He said, what should the web do? And while we as developers can you know, pompously discuss, oh, we think the web should do this, our users already know what they want the web to do. They want it to do everything. And I'm one of them. I hate apps. I hate having to install an app that I'm only going to ever use once. If you're a restaurant and I only use your services once every six months, chances are you don't need an app. And so, yes. <laughs> and, and so I love, love, love working on the browser and showing just how capable the browser is. But for us to be able to create the same interesting experiences del delivered by native apps, the browser manufacturers also have to come to the fore. And I think it's safe to say that in recent years, they have been actually doing this. Enough warming you up. I think it's time to actually get to the demos. <laughs> People in front, I <coughs> hope you're ready. <laughs> cool. I'm guessing they didn't tell you about the helmet requirement. Cool. I think we can all be in danger. So at number five, obviously, of ways to kill a perfectly good drone, we've got JavaScript. Now, the first incarnation of this talk was using Node to try and do what Jerry did. And I had to uninstall drivers, install drivers, and it worked on one machine and didn't work on many other machines. It was just chaotic. And I asked the question, how on earth would I distribute the solution to other people? And so I decided to look at a browser solution instead. That's the real reason why I changed, not because I couldn't get it working seam seamlessly. <laughs> the browser is really, really powerful lately. And the one thing that I really like about the browser is Web Bluetooth. It allows the browser to really start interacting with things around us. And you will see how. My favorite thing about the browser is that we use JavaScript <laughs> to, to build things in the browser. And the best thing about JavaScript is not that it doesn't have types or that it doesn't care that you write code however you want to. My favorite thing about JavaScript is the community. We have such a rich community, such a rich open source community. And the stats that we saw this morning from the talk about the use of JavaScript and TypeScript really resonates with me. And so I did what every single JavaScript developer does. I looked for a script called drone.js. <laughs> Interestingly enough, <laughs> I found this GitHub repo <laughs> by Peter O'Shennessy, and he had this one script in his entire repo called dronev1.2.js. I was like, this is it. <laughs> it used Web Bluetooth as a base, and I took that script and built onto it. And from that, I managed to create two scripts one called drone connection management.js and another one called drone control. The one just facilitates all the complexities of dealing with web Bluetooth 
and the other one just exposes an interface for me to be able to send commands to the drone, like, hey, drone, move left, right? And then the drone goes, sure, I'll do that. What this allows me to do is to write code that looks like this. To simply say, drone, move left, move right, maybe try and do a backflip and let's see what happens. <laughs> but I mean, just from judging from the switch statement, this is a pretty sure way of killing your drone, right? I'm not gonna show you a demo for this because this forms the basis of everything else that you're going to see today. So I'll move on to number four of ways to kill a perfectly good drone. Try and get your drone to mimic other devices. <laughs> So, I am absolutely passionate about human-computer interactions. It feels like we've been stuck with the mouse and the keyboard for such a long time that the way we think about solutions is also limited to, to just that scope. I saw this morning when I looked at the program again that during the party we'll be playing something called Joust. <laughs> Woo! Absolutely love Joust, right? And Joust proves the point of just how incredible the experiences can be when we take away the mouse and the keyboard and we introduce something interesting. And so I absolutely love exploring how humans can interact with different computers. And one way that the browser can do it is through its web APIs that get shipped with most browsers nowadays. When I started working on this talk, the, my favorite API is called the Census API. It was still under the experimental flag on Chrome. I think it's been standardized now, I'm not too sure. I'll just have to double check that. But the sensors API gives you access to the proximity sensor, to sensors such as the gyroscope and the ambient light sensor on your devices. If your device is an accelerometer, um, this computer that I got a week ago seems to also have one. I discovered this morning as I was testing. And uh, as well as your cell phones. This means that from your cell phone, we can now get access to the data in your accelerometer and build interesting experiences out of that. What this means for us is that we can simply instantiate a new sensor just like this. Maybe that should be a const. I don't think I'm gonna reassign that sensor. But anyway, <laughs> sensor is now a new accelerometer and to start reading this data, we simply just ask the sensor to start. You can't read data forever. You have to stop at some point. So we need a way to also stop that. And then of course, we've got a um, callback function that we can pass to this event handler to try and do something with this data. What this means is that we can then get our drone to move based on the position of our phones or tablets or anything that has an accelerometer um, anyway. So these values are given to you in X, Y, Z coordinates and as you move it around, you get the different X, Y, Z values. Now I went through a very scientific process of mapping these X, Y, Z values to movement of the drones by simply console logging what all these values are when the phone is in <laughs> the different positions. <laughs> And then simply telling the drone, if X is between here and Y is between here, do this. What this ends up looking like is this. So as I lift my phone up, the drone can then take off. When I lean it forward, the drone moves forward. Backwards, the drone moves backwards. And when I put it down, the drone tries to land. <laughs> As you can see, that's a perfectly good way to kill a working drone. I'm gonna move on to the next one. <laughs> Try and fly the drone without hands. I'm a big Marvel fan. Tony Stark blows my mind. And watching him interact with Jarvis without even touching anything has always been something I've wanted to recreate. So when I started this, I immediately knew that this is something I want to explore. And so, I found this thing, it's called the, the Leap Motion Sensor, right? It's aimed at game developers. Um, I wonder how I found out about it. But what this thing does is that it maps your hands in the digital space and all of the joins in your hands. It can identify different hands and it allows you to interact with, with items in the digital space based on the movement and positioning of your hands. Again, it gives us these values in X, Y, Z coordinates and using that, I went through the very scientific process of console logging those values <laughs> in order to fly the drone again. And so, maybe I should show you this in, in a demo. Let me see if I've got stuff running. Uh, I'm 
we just need screen share, nothing else. Sorry, team. And I should probably move this over there. Cool. Don't do live demos. It's a trap. Cool. Let's look at very beautiful website. You can see that I'm a full stack developer. <laughs> So what we have here is a very simple HTML page built with no framework at all. And we have a script here, that magic drone connection management script that I wrote. What it allows me to do is that once the drone is on, you can, I hope you can see it blinking. Uh, I guess I can do that. I've got green lights blinking. means that it's ready to pair. And if I then click connect to drone, it should appear there. So it exposes a, 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 a Bluetooth ID that I can then connect to based on the characteristics of the drone. Once I've paired the drone, I can... <laughs> take off. Uh, it didn't pair. One second. What do you do if it doesn't work? You just reload the page, right? <laughs> and... We're waiting for it. It's still in pairing mode. <laughs> I didn't leave those console logs in. I might just have to restart the drone. Let's reload that. Do you guys remember that first slide that I started with when I said it's time for a demo? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and now it's doing something I've never seen in my life. <laughs> If someone has a Bluetooth device on, please stop using it, I beg. <laughs> cool, let's try that again. Cool, the demo or the drone is fleshly restarted. We've reloaded our page, click connect to drone. Will the drone appear? There we go. Woo. Let's see if it pairs. Oh, the drone is actually too far from me. Um, so I'm going to put it here instead. Let's see if it then connects. Let's try that again. Pay. No. My goodness. What is happening? Let's try that one more time. If it now crashes in my face, it's fine. It's worth it. Let me put that there. Power on. It's okay, I've got backup videos, so if, if, <laughs> if all else fails, I will prove to you that it once worked. <laughs> I'll blame it on being in Europe, it's fine. <laughs> cool, let's see. We can connect to it and it still does not want to connect. Cool, I'm gonna move on and I'll show you guys a video of this instead in a second, but I wanna to talk to you about something else first. Just need to remove this battery. <laughs> that is the most software dev thing I've done in this entire talk. Should have tried one more time. If it works now, it's because the screen wasn't full screen. <laughs> we know who to blame for that. And it just disconnected again. Let's just try that one more time. I'm scared of taking this off from my hands because it will hurt me. So Tejas, now do you see why I need to retire this talk? Just try. If you have a Bluetooth device on, <laughs> please switch it off. Cool. Let's try this one last time and then I'm going to move on and show you the videos instead. Let's try that again. 
connect to the drone, it needs to be on first. That's generally how electronics work. There we go. Connect. There it is. It's not paired, I hope. I'm gonna click take off just to check, but the light should be solid green. It's cool, I'm gonna move on from that one. Cool, and show you the video instead. Let's move that there. Just need a second. great opportunity for one of the sponsors to say, if you want to see it work, come to our sponsorship booth. <laughs> what that's actually supposed to look like is this, is that as I move my hands around this um, thing, you're supposed to see it send all of this data to the different parts of the drone. Now this would allow me to do really interesting movements as well, such as rotational movements, so rotating to the right and rotating to the left, which creates more danger and a greater chance of us actually crashing this incredible drone. Cool, and that's that. <laughs> a part of me is still really hoping that this thing comes back to life, especially for the next part of this talk. Now, I promise to tell you about myself. I have a nine-year-old brother, and I think he inspires a lot of the work that I do. One of the things that he makes me think about is the future of technology and the role that my country in particular has to play in it. It wouldn't be an important talk without stats, so I'm just gonna put out some stats there, just to, you know, check box. Our unemployment rate is sitting at just under 35% as of the first quarter of this year. Now. If you think this is bad, wait till you find out that almost 70% of our youth is unemployed. And our definition of youth is quite generous. It's described as anyone between the ages of 15 and 30 that is not currently registered in an institution of learning. Did I press something? Yeah, that is not currently um, in an institution of learning. It also includes people who, it only includes people who are actively seeking employment. So the people that have given up, that have not been able to find any employment, are not actually included in that stat. Which means that the real number is probably significantly higher than that. What's confusing on the other hand is that we also have a critical skills shortage in the country. There's an estimated 70,000 jobs that we can't seem to fill in the ICT sector alone. Now, this means that we need to find interesting and innovative ways to get people into tech. We kept talking about language and communication throughout this conference today. And I think one of the interesting things I've found is that as technologists, we often get stuck in the detail of what it is that we're doing, even when we talk about people, even when we talk to other people that are not actually technical. I still don't understand blockchain because every single time I've had blockchain enthusiasts explain it to me, it's always like, ah, oh, decentralized, take over the banks, right? And I think we need to find a way to make technology relatable, especially in the context of a country like mine, where most people, or a big portion of our population, doesn't have access to computers until they get to universities. And so, one of the ways that I've found that are quite interesting is to fly drones with bananas. Now I'm gonna try this one more time and hope that it works, right? So, I've got a couple of bananas here. They are real, I promise. I checked, just this morning. And so, <laughs> I'm gonna put up my webpage again, my very interesting website. Yep. 
Awesome. Cool. Perfect. It's perfect. It's fine. I'll just use this. Cool. Let's go to fruits. The button is green here that says connect to drone, so maybe it'll be different. <laughs> Cool, so what I have here in front of me, and I think the camera will show you in a second, is that I've got a couple of fruits that I bought from a store here. So if it doesn't work, we blame it on the Hungarian bananas. <laughs> um, and what we can do is that we can just plug in, I mean, this is very scientific stuff, right? <laughs> and you can see that all I need to do is very scientifically just plug in these bananas And using this, I can now build very interesting ways of interacting with this drone. I'm going to try it one more time. I'm going to keep it close and risk the danger of it crashing in my face. That would definitely make a memorable talk. And we see it there again. We pay. And it is still refusing to pay for some odd reason. Let's try that one more time. There's one thing I didn't try, actually. Can I right click? Control F5. No. There we go. Cool. Now I can right click. Yes. Hard reload. There we go. Cool. Let's try that. Let's power it up again. It's okay. I've got a video for this as well. So you're fine. Cool. So there's our drone again ready to pay. I'm just going to reload that just for luck. <laughs> it's looking for the drone. Found it. Let's see if putting it down helps at all. And we're going to click pay. Still no. But it's cool. I think for this one, We've got some, we've got a button there or this block that tells us what's supposed to be happening with the drone, right? And what's happening here is that, is this plugged in? Yes, it is. Is that by me touching the different drones, move some plastic, by me touching the different controllers, I can then start sending commands to the drone. I should probably close my dev tools. See, so there, did I connect the correct things? Man, what on earth is going on? Not even this is working out. Jeez. Hold on. Uh, I can't do that, can I? then I'm going to disconnect from the screen. Let's just do this instead. I nearly said something that I don't think I'm allowed to say on stage <laughs> about the device that I'm using. There we go. Cool. So it's a USB problem. Cool. And so now what we can do is that we can start seeing that I can send the different commands to the drone based on what I'm doing, right? And now we can even start doing interesting things like um, trying to flip the drone. There we go, right? So that's supposed to flip the drone. <laughs> Should I try to connect now? <laughs> Funny thing is that I tested this just this morning and it worked in my room. <laughs> that is the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Let's see. Repairing. Maybe. Let's 
try and reset it one last time. Um, the drone is just choosing not to pay, which is not the problem I had earlier. <laughs> and this is why this talk is now retired. <laughs> Need to switch it on. One more time. There we go. Let's try that again. Connect. Searching. There we go. Yeah, it is. Sorry, say that again. That is not a bad idea. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to restart this server locally. What's funny is that I had a talk. Um, my VS Code is frozen for some reason. <laughs> let's see let's try that one last time and there we go it's Murphy's Law right everything that can go wrong will go wrong this is it this is it final try final attempt What's horrible is that I'm, as soon as I finish this talk, I'm gonna go back and try and figure out what's happening and then it's just gonna work immediately. <laughs> Murphy's Law indeed. So, one last attempt, and then I'm letting this go and showing you guys the video. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, go to Budapest. Cool. Let's try that one more time. Drone is available for pairing. It still says paired. Ooh. Would you like to see it flip? There we go. I forgot to program a landing button. <laughs> Let's try a safe land. Cool. gone over time and so as much as I would love to show you that other uh, demo from before I'll show you after the closing of this uh, conference for today but the number one way of making sure that you kill your drone that I wanted to show you but unfortunately can't because the internet isn't too great in here is to fly it with people <laughs> Someone said, oh crap, right here in front, right? And this is definitely a guaranteed way of killing your drone. Now, the idea here was to let you tweet commands to this drone, yes. right? And how it's supposed to work is that you're supposed to tweet with the hashtag JSConfBP and send commands to the drone. Don't reach for your phones, please. <laughs> I think my server's running and it might just... <laughs> So please, do not tweet. <laughs> and how it's supposed to work is that every five seconds or three seconds, it would get a random tweet with the hashtag, put your phone down to it. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> it would get one random tweet and pick out all of these different words. The next incarnation of this demo is supposed to use some sentiment analysis and only pick up nice complimenting tweets. <laughs> So if you say nice things about my talk, then your commands would be sent here. Before I close off, I want to give you a bonus one. 
the most guaranteed way, it seems, to crash a perfectly good working drone is to travel 15,000 kilometers across the world to a conference. Very short story. Last night, we had the speaker's dinner. And a lot of the speakers that I said to us kept making me anxious about the fact that I had no recordings of my demo. They were like, but what if the drone doesn't work? Have you tested it since you arrived? Right? Just today, they were telling me, what if your laptop explodes? Right? <laughs> so I was so nervous. I got to my room last night. I pulled out the drone, and I tried to fly it to see if it works. I turned it on. It took off and crashed into the door immediately. <laughs> I tried it again. It did the exact same thing again. So I put it away, went to bed, woke up early this morning, took the entire thing apart, put it back together, and I think it did a pretty decent job barring the Bluetooth connection issues. The number one question I always get when I talk about this drone is why? Why on earth do you do this? <laughs> and, and why does your company even let you waste time doing this stuff? <laughs> I think as developers, we are in those unique fields where you can never really stop learning. So much changes in our ecosystem, and it's so difficult to keep up with everything. The rate at which we get these changes is absolutely gobsmacking, and it's very difficult to keep up. This is a problem that I see across our business. I have very senior and experienced engineers coming to me and saying, I've been writing C-sharp for the past 20 years. What on earth is this JavaScript thing, and how do I go about learning it? As someone in my role, I need to try and keep up to date with what's happening. And one of the ways I do that is by building useless things. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Learning doesn't have to be boring. Learning can be fun. You determine what that fun is. For me, it's building useless things like flying drones with bananas. But for you, it could be something else, like building IoT devices from your home with your partner. So for me, this is a way that I use to communicate to other people that aren't necessarily tech savvy, the peers, even those that are tech savvy like bananas. And this is a way that I make sure that I, keep learn, that, that I keep learning and growing. So the one thing that I'd like you to take away from this talk is two things. One, don't do live demos. Two, <laughs> keep playing. Friends, all binary and non-binary, my name is Lakin Kosi. Thank you very much.